This is a video we uploaded on our alien and UFO channel, Destination Declassified. If you have any interest in the search for life outside of Earth, don't forget to check out Destination Declassified for all your UFO and alien news. Now, please enjoy. It is known as one of the most violent cases involving extraterrestrials ever to be documented. UFOs appeared in the skies above a small Brazilian city and discharged lights that caused injuries to many men, women and children. It is a rare case that culminated in at least two deaths and the alleged suicide of the commander of the Brazilian Air Force. And yet surprisingly, little is known about the Colas UFO flap outside of Brazil. On the northeastern coast of Brazil lies the second largest of the Brazilian states, Para. Here, the island city of Claraz is separated from the mainland because of its location in the Amazon River Delta, as it empties into the Atlantic Ocean. During the late 1970s, at the time of the events in question, there were approximately 2,000 residents living there. Claraz relied heavily on the simple professions of fishing and farming. This makes the occurrences seem all the more credible. There had been no reports of strange incidents before, but most of the sightings began in August of 1977. Abel Trindade was at home on the 14th of September 1977. It was 9.30 p.m. and he was listening to the radio when he saw a blue light coming through the ceiling. He became paralyzed and unable to scream for help. After the incident, he suffered from a sore throat and headache for several days. It was very early in the morning on the 4th of October in Belém, Brazil when 48-year-old farm worker Benedito saw a bright blue light. It was hovering just above a treetop. It stayed there for a few seconds before slowly moving away. It made no noise, and although Benedito was afraid, he was unharmed. Unlike another 40-year-old farmer, Manuel dos Santos, just three weeks later, he was in bed when suddenly the interior of his house was lit up by a bright light that came through the roof. Manuel tried to get out of bed but was paralyzed and unable to scream for help. After several minutes, he could eventually stand up, but the left side of his body was both sore and numb for over a week. In the days that followed, he would see many lights on the horizon, very low in the sky. They would slow down, speed up, and then suddenly disappear. On the 23rd of January 1978, Manuel Filho went down to the beach to meet his friends and go fishing. As he arrived, he saw a strange light hovering over the beach. He realized that the light was emanating from some sort of object. It was about 10 feet wide and five feet high. It was dark in color, yet somehow transparent and with a green bluish light underneath. Manuel ran back to his father's house to get his brother. By this point, many of the people were afraid of the UFOs and their light beams, so his brother refused to come. When he returned to the beach, his friends were waiting and they all saw the craft leave at a very high speed. These are just four of over 300 sightings that were reported in Colores and the surrounding towns and villages during 1977 and 78. Several people described seeing lights at night and then being attacked by rays. Some were even able to show burn marks and scarring where they had been hit. Others showed strange symptoms, such as hair loss in areas where the beam had struck or rashes and numbness. The situation had become so bad that many of the citizens were leaving the area. This compelled the mayor of Clarez, as well as officials from about 30 other villages in the area to request that the Brazilian government send in the air force the mayor said that there wasn't a moment of peace during that time. It was a chaotic situation, and many of the women and children were being evacuated from the island, although the men would stay to protect their homes and belongings. At night, the men would build large fires and shoot projectiles into the air, hoping that it would scare away what they called the Chupa Chupas. In Latin America, there has long been a mythology surrounding livestock deaths, and their suspected exaccination. The creature assumed to be the culprit for these happenings is known by the Portuguese world chupacabra, which translates as goat sucker. The people of Clarez now used a similar word to describe the UFOs that they had encountered. Many of those who had been struck by the beams were left with small depressions or marks on their skin. Some also said they felt as though blood had been drawn during the attack, and this resulted in fainting and reports of anemia in some of the victims through loss of blood. At first, strange lights were seen at night, out over the Atlantic Ocean, and were described as being vague and shapeless. 
but as the lights came closer inland, they were actually discovered to be UFOs. Some of these crafts were said to be ovoid, others were saucer-shaped or disc-like, with spinning lights revolving around the exterior. Some were described as umbrella-shaped, and others as hat-shaped. Some silver, and others brown. Some huge, and others quite small. It appeared as though there were several types of UFO, all converging on the one place. The Portuguese translation of the word, unidentified flying object, is extremely complex, so the islanders use many other words to describe their experiences, calling the strange phenomena names such as the worm, the thing, the fire, the animal, or the bug. Because they came from the direction of the Atlantic, some of the local people thought that the UFOs were rising up out of the sea. This led to many theories about an underwater base around the Bea de Sol area. On the 29th of October, Benedito Campos and his pregnant wife, Silvia Marie, were relaxing in their living room. Through the window, they could see an oval-shaped object hovering outside. It was silver in colour and appeared to have a green searchlight. As the couple watched, the light fired through the window directly hitting Silvia and causing her to fall into a trance-like state. She later said that she felt as though her veins had swollen after she had been struck. While Benedito was trying to help his wife, the couple saw a pair of figures enter their property. One of the figures was carrying a golden torch. A neighbor came running to the house to help the couple and the figures left. Now almost catatonic, Sylvia was carried by her husband to the neighbor's home, whilst the strange object seemed to follow them. It then struck Benedito with its green beam of light, leaving him almost paralyzed. The neighbor helped to get the couple to his boat so that they could be taken to the nearest medical center. The neighbor reported that the UFO followed them to the boat, but did not emit the beam again. The couple had to stay in hospital for some days after their terrifying experience. It was feared that Silvia may suffer a miscarriage because of her distress, and Benedito endured a debilitating bout of depression. His mother said that she found him weeping frequently in the days following their ordeal, and the Camposes were not the only people to see figures inside of the UFOs. In January of the following year, Francisco Enrico de Souza was approached by a light in the sky. As it got nearer, he could see that the light was part of a much larger UFO. The object was cylindrical in shape, 15 feet across and at least 25 feet in diameter. Spellbound, Francisco was rooted to the spot as he stared up at the craft. Once it was directly overhead, a door dropped open, emitting a great deal of light. He could see two people sitting in the craft, as though it was a car. They looked to be a male and a female and sat completely still, never moving. Then it was though a magnet pulled Francisco up. Terrified, he grabbed onto a palm tree, wrapping his arms and legs around the trunk. The light was very hot, burning his skin, and Francisco was in a great deal of pain because his chest was scraped raw from clinging onto the tree. He thought that he was going to die and began to cry. Suddenly, some sort of hot liquid was poured onto him, burning his skin even more, but Francisco would still not let go. Eventually, the doors to the craft closed and it flew away. It was late October in the nearby town of Santo Antonio da Tua. Just before midnight, Manuel da Espirito Santa was hanging out in front of his house with his high school buddies, Julio, Polo, Deca, and Carlito. Suddenly, Manuel could see a reddish orange star-shaped object heading in their direction from the east. As it got closer, the light became more yellow. The object stopped about 60 feet in front of the group of friends. Manuel could now see that it was about four to five feet wide and barrel shaped with two tubes leading off. One of the tubes was red, the other blue. The top half of the object emitted a blue light and inside sat two human-like creatures who appeared to be flying the craft. There was some sort of division between the two crew members who seemed to be a male and a female and were wearing headphones and glasses. The red tube was pointed at Manuel and his friends and a red light ray hit the group. Manuel felt like he had been electrocuted. He became semi-conscious and was unable to move his arms and legs. The craft now began to move away. It rose up in a swaying motion, gaining speed and altitude as it did so. Manuel felt numb for several minutes until the paralysis eventually wore off. Claude Amira was able to describe her late night visitor in even greater detail. She was asleep in her bed when a bright flash of light awoke her. The light beamed down from the roof of her house and struck her, burning her left breast. Now in a lot of pain, she tried to scream but was unable to make any noise. She saw that the object was umbrella shaped and from within it, she could see two occupants. They had clear skin, oriental eyes and large ears. The figures were dressed in green, skin tight suits. One of them carried some type of gun which it fired at Claude Mira. She was struck again with a beam of light and collapsed. 
The experience left her with a sickening headache and weakness for several days. Her health was never fully restored. She was treated by the local doctor, Dr. Calvajo. Dr. Calvajo had treated many of the victims and saw their injuries firsthand. The doctor was only 22 at the time, newly qualified and skeptical of the UFO and extraterrestrial stories. She worked at the local medical center. During the Clores UFO flap, Carvalho treated over 30 people who had claimed to have been attacked by the Chupa Chupa beam. She said that the victims suffered from burns that were nearly always on the neck and or chest area. The burns would look very similar to a bite mark, two small parallel puncture wounds. Many of the victims would also have symptoms of anemia. This led to a belief in some of the UFO affected areas that the beam of light was somehow targeting people for their blood. The doctor kept and compared notes about her patients and noticed that they appeared to have been chosen at random. They were both male and female and of different ages. They all had similar symptoms though, a raised temperature, chronic migraines, nausea, body tremors, dizziness, and extreme fatigue. Many also complained of an intense burning sensation around the area that they had been hit by the beam. And typically they also had two small puncture marks. Carvalho found that all of her patients had wounds to the torso and that their hair would later fall out at the point of impact. She was curious as to what could cause those sorts of burns, and she was also baffled by the hair loss. Many of the victims never had hair regrow in the affected areas again. She took two of her patients to the capital of Berlin for further treatment, and they later died. One had flu-like symptoms, and the cause of death given was a stroke. Strangely, the two small puncture wounds on her left breast were not mentioned on the death certificate. Dr. Carvalho had treated cancer patients before and was familiar with radiotherapy treatment and she felt that the burns were consistent with that type of therapy associated with cobalt radiation. Most of her patients told her the same story. A UFO would arrive without warning and a three inch beam of light would hit them. Then after they had been struck by the beam, they were paralyzed as though a heavy weight was pushed against their body. Their eyes were open and although they would try to scream, they would find it impossible. The beam was almost too much to bear and felt like a cigarette burn. Eventually the light beam would withdraw and the craft would disappear. It seemed that the alien attackers never had to search for their targets. There was no searchlight or spotlight that gave a victim any warning that an attack was imminent. The craft would just come down and then the beam would strike. The precise target on the body would be random, sometimes the face or torso, sometimes an arm or a leg. The regional air command of the Brazilian Air Force arrived 90 days after they had been requested to begin their investigation with a group of only 30 men. The core team comprised of just six men, the doctor would later report that she was initially ordered by the Air Force to persuade the locals that it was all just a case of mass hysteria and that the people were suffering from some sort of sociogenic illness. The authorities did not want widespread panic, but the doctors refused to do this, even though she was treated with dismissal. No longer cynical, she had experienced the phenomena herself when she was walking down the main street in Clarez late one afternoon. She saw some sort of UFO hovering quite low over the road. It was cylindrical in shape, and there were two small beings inside of the craft. She believed they were no more than four feet tall. The investigation into the strange events was headed by Captain Eurinj Hollanda, who was head of the information office and his second in command, Sergeant Flavio Costa. The two men led all communications during the inquiry. From the late 77 to early 78, they carried out a very comprehensive investigation into the sightings. They interviewed hundreds of witnesses from Clarez and the surrounding villages in what became known as Operation Saucer. The team began evidence gathering, but they had little in the way of equipment for the undertaking, just a few cameras and tape recorders. However, many of them were able to experience the phenomenon for themselves and saw the mysterious UFOs many times during the investigation. They became so familiar with the schedules of the craft that they could predict where and when one would appear next and were able to take footage and photographs of what they saw. This included a film of the craft going into the sea Unfortunately, after only four months, Operation Saucer was ordered to close down. However, by this point, Captain Hollander and Sergeant Costa had collected together a report of over 500 pages, as well as more than 200 photographs, film of the UFOs, numerous sketches, and maps showing the routes that the craft would take. Although it had now officially been closed, the investigators continued to work on the case because of their own personal interest. In spite of their findings being top secret, random pages from the inquiry started to leak out to the press and ufologists were able to assemble a file of over 300 encounters and sightings. Over half of these incidents had been experienced by the investigators themselves. 
20 years later, Captain Holanda was interviewed for a Brazilian UFO magazine. He had been retired for quite some time and decided that he wanted to share his first-hand knowledge and evidence of the Claras flap with the world. During this interview, he told a strange story of his experience during the 1977 investigation. Like many of the other witnesses that he had questioned, he was awoken at night by the beam of a bright light. He then felt the presence of a being enter his room and lay down beside him. The being had no discernible facial features and spoke into Hollander's ear with what he described as a metallic sounding voice, telling him that he meant him no harm. Only three months later, Captain Hollander was found hanged at his home from a suspected suicide. This led to many conspiracy theories, and it was alleged that the government murdered Hollander in order to shut him up. Other theories about what was really going on in Colorado have led to speculation about Russia and China using the area for testing of new technology. This is always the case when there are UFO sightings over the Americas. There have also been rumors about CIA drones and even top secret testing carried out by the USA itself. So it's unknown which country's governments, if any, would have been responsible for the captain's death. Ball lighting is often used as an explanation for UFO sightings and has been offered up as a reason for the lights that were seen entering several homes in the area but there is little evidence for this. Also, not a lot is known about ball lighting, and it's difficult to explain one strange phenomena with something else that is just as inexplicable. Because many of the victims were asleep or in bed at the time of their encounters, sleep paralysis has been proposed as a reason for their experience. Sleep paralysis is a documented condition, usually affecting a person as they are either falling asleep or just waking up. This will explain some of the things felt by the eyewitnesses, but not the burns, puncture marks, or other later ongoing symptoms, such as headaches and a lack of mobility. In 2005, a group of Brazilian ufologists were successful in their campaign to have the Air Force open some of their classified files. It became clear that Brazil had quite a long history of government involvement in UFO hunting, and there had been top secret investigations into sightings or unidentified aerial phenomenon since as early as 1954. Much of the evidence on file had been gathered by the Air Force, but there were also reports from the Brazilian Army, Navy, and intelligence personnel. A lot of data had been collected, including photographs and film, as well as written documentation. The Air Force finally agreed after acknowledging the importance of ufology. Several of the files were examined, including reports from Clarez. The astounding occurrences that took place during Operation Saucer make it one of the most important events in ufology although many details of the incident have never been revealed. Several of the key witnesses have since died, and much of the evidence is still classified. And so, we may never know the full story of the infamous Clarez UFO incident.